We have made the case that part of the new apologetics is to confront not only arguments, but attitudes. We've looked at narcissism as one example of the emerging attitudes that are prevailing in our culture today. And today we look at nihilism. What has happened in our culture is that nihilism has made its way into the fabric of every other worldview. We see the remnants of nihilism everywhere as our culture settles into self-contradiction, as it is content with a self-refuting worldview. We really see the face of nihilism today everywhere. But what about the gospel? Does the gospel give us anything that resembles nihilistic thought as it calls us to hate our lives, to hate our life in this world? We'll examine exactly what that means on this episode of The New Apologetics. Well, welcome to the program, everybody. My name is Emilio Ramos. It's good to be with you for another episode of The New Apologetics. And now today, as we've stated, we are going to be tackling the issue of nihilism and what are sort of the virtual, practical, everyday life appearances of nihilism in our culture. There's a sense in which we can say that nihilism is ubiquitous in the culture. It's everywhere. When we think of nihilism as basically a rejection of all fundamental uh, core essential elements in reality. When we're thinking of a worldview, for example, or of a philosophy, nihilism rejects any sort of fundamental belief in ultimate meaning, ultimate truth, ultimate morality, and certainly ultimate purpose. So that man is ultimately a meaningless, random occurrence in a meaningless and a random universe. Nihilism is a worldview that truly seeks its own demise and it's quite content to have that. Nihilism has also been called a characteristic of other worldviews. So you can have postmodernism, for example, you can have existentialism, you can have a subjective worldview that has nihilistic tendencies, that tends towards destruction, that tends toward the elimination of ultimate knowing, of epistemology, of the idea that we can know things for certain. So nihilism and radical skepticism in, in many ways goes hand in hand. Now when we think about our culture and you think about talking to the average person on the streets, even if they've been raised in the Judeo-Christian way, even if they have a religious background, typically the nominal adherent to his or her worldview or his or her religion has a nihilistic streak within them. And often you can see this in the irrational way that people think. On the one hand, people demand for evidence and scientific data to back up somebody's claims. Let's say we're talking about the reliability of the Bible and they want to see extensive evidence. They want to see data. They want to see manuscript evidence. They want to understand something about the history and the composition of the Bible. They'll accuse Christians at having a spurious understanding of history where they don't even understand bibliology, canonicity, the, text, the, the textual transmission or tradition of their own biblical text. Many times those accusations are quite warranted because a lot of Christians don't have that kind of knowledge uh, that they can actually talk about, especially off the top of their head, let alone having done any kind of research. And so for many Christians, they don't even have that kind of working knowledge in their mind in terms of their own world view. But really, when you think about how nihilism has worked its way into our culture, in the same breath that people call for facts and evidence and data, to the same extent, to the radical opposite of that is a total irrationality within their worldview where they don't believe they have to account for anything. They don't have to account for absolute meaning. They don't have to account for ultimate reality, for knowledge. They don't need to account for ethics, for epistemology. They don't need to account for the history of philosophy, the origin of ideas. For the average person on the street, it has become a religion of nihilistic pragmatism. And as the new apologetics goes, we have to understand that the typical person, where people live, 
in their worldview, day to day, is exactly our focus. Remember, when we're talking about the new apologetics, we are convinced that there is an emerging worldview that is upon us in the 21st century and that that worldview is globalist, it is pluralist, it is pagan, mainly Eastern in terms of its spirituality, and it's also in a sense post-secular. It's, there's a sense in which we've gone beyond the secular and people are now opting for some kind of pseudo-spirituality. But it's also transhumanist. It's also the integration of more and more radical technology that is integrated into every facet and every aspect of our lives so that really the modern man can scarcely imagine themselves apart from technology. What we're saying in a new apologetic approach to the 21st century, those factors have to be faced head on. We need to prepare for the generation that now is and the generation that will mature in the next several decades that will not even comprehend what it means to be human apart from some kind of transhumanist, globalist, and pagan worldview. And that to us is a major development in the whole field of Western apologetics and Western evangelism. And that is something that as the church, we must be ready to confront. Now, along with that new focus in apologetics, there's also new attitudes that we focused on. There is a, what we looked at last time in terms of a radical narcissistic attitude in the culture today that everything, including technology, has simply facilitated a kind of person that seeks to have instantaneous gratification at the tip of their fingers. They want instantaneous convenience, customization, and they want to be consumers of all things in the culture, and they want to uh, realize their consumer dreams as quickly as possible. It's like the American dream on steroids, and that certainly is the kind of the average day American today. And it's no wonder, because when you look at what's going on in the culture, you see that people are bombarded with advertisements, nonstop push towards consumerism. And so in a sense, the kind of person that is emerging, both morally, ethically, philosophically, is a byproduct of what's happening in our culture today. When we think about these nihilistic themes in our culture today, they really are, like I said, ubiquitous. They are everywhere. They are in the pop culture. They are in the consumer-driven world that we live in today. You can see it in political groups, anarchist groups, autonomous humanism. You can see it in the push in the field of anthropology and in the field of sexuality, a major push, the eliminary of the binary, which has so much to do with paganism on the one hand, but it also is essentially and fundamentally nihilistic. It is the destruction of man ultimately. And is always, um, there is always a bit of irony in that because in the pursuit of self-authentication, in the pursuit of self-realization and self-expression, one thing that we have to remember is that this culture is actually losing the self in the very pursuit of what they call self. And so we have to understand that in this narcissistic age in which we live, where everything becomes about you feeling authentically human by bending and stretching and remaking reality as you want it to be. And obviously in the area of anthropology, gender and those kinds of things, these are the radical extremes, but these are the aspects of this kind of worldview and what's happening in a pluralistic society and a society that's completely gone not only postmodern, but post everything, post philosophical, post cultural. Some people are calling for a post evolutionary model now where we are going to bypass our evolution. We're going to create the future we want for ourselves and not merely be subjects of some random evolutionary process. It really is a new world that we're looking at in the 21st century. And that's why these attitudes are the attitudes we need to be able to minister the gospel to a people that feel completely entitled to remake reality however you want that reality to be. 
Now, obviously, with the invention of the metaverse, virtual reality, mixed reality, augmented reality, that sort of virtual world that is quickly coming upon us is the world that we will have to combat. It will be the world of AI. It will be the world where machines take on more and more personhood and human beings become less and less identified as distinct, unique image bearers where there is something actually distinct about human beings that gives them inherent worth that is not found in the entire realm of creation. Those kind of biblical distinctions are quickly fading away. The traces of Nihilism are found all over the culture. You can see it in the assisted suicide issue where people are being given the right to simply kill themselves if they'd like, if they don't feel like life is worth living. And I'll touch on that in a moment. But also in a post-everything culture, there's also simulation theory. There is post-reality theory. There is integral thought. There is Jungian psychology that calls for the elimination of the one and the many and the joining of opposites in what Peter Jones has identified for us as a truly pagan oneist system where evil and good are the same thing, where male and female is to be found in all of us. Those kinds of categories at the end of the day are nihilistic and they make for the destruction of biblical and true therefore, true biblical anthropology and a view of man in relationship to the world around him. But there is also political nihilism. We've seen this recently with Antifa, radical anarchist uh, leftist progressive worldview. There's also the postmoderns in the world, cultural creatives that are now taking up the cause of postmodernity. There is the sexual libertarian. There is the abortion issue, which is perhaps one of the ultimate examples of nihilism in our culture today. But fundamentally, it is humanistic and it's postmodern and it's spiritually pagan and it's also trans. Humanist. These are the forefronts at which in apologetics we need to recalibrate our focus and start zeroing in on these issues that will become what creates and what shapes the mind of the future generation. It will become absolutely essential for us to remember that nihilism is ultimately the adoption of a worldview that is self-refuting, self-contradictory, and that it has absolutely no problem with self-contradiction. This was what makes nihilism so deadly. It creates a certain attitude and a certain disposition in people. You can see this with people on a college campus, young people that are quite content with living in a meaningless world of absolute random chaos. They're perfectly fine with it as long as they can live the life they want to live. And so ultimately, nihilism is sort of a support base for many young people today. They think it's a cool, hip, radical worldview, and it's a philosophy they can adopt because that philosophy will never judge them. It will never tell them how to live their lives. And so ultimately, it is truly the ultimate antinomian philosophy to adopt, and that's why it's so popular among so many young people today. Is it any wonder, therefore, that Nietzsche was a angry, volatile, hostile individual who hated uh, anything like organized religion, particularly as it pertained to the Christian God. He is the one who declared, after all, God is dead and I have killed him. He thought that he would rid the world of religion. And of course, we know that that was, a, that was at face value, this, one, of the, one of the stupidest comments ever made. And of course, Nietzsche himself died in utter despair, complete mockery to the philosophical world. But that doesn't mean that his ideas do not persist and that his ideas do not metastasize into the future. They certainly do. Now, in our last episode, we talked about a similar phenomenon with the emergent church, that although the emergent church, in a sense, in an organized, identifiable way, as an organized system of thought, or as a movement, has sort of faded out of existence, that doesn't mean that the movement is not still with us in some way. It certainly is. It has a 
affected the evangelical church in amazing ways, maybe even more ways than it could have had it still remained in some sort of organized form. The same is true of nihilism. Now, there is a sense in which we can use fatalism and nihilism to our advantage as Christians. As we point out nihilistic tendencies in people's worldviews, we need to push for the antithesis, as it were, to show them the ultimate conclusion of nihilism and where it leads. After all, every nihilist holds something dear. Every nihilist has things in their lives that he or she deems important, that people love, that people cherish. No matter how nihilistic they are, in other words, there are no ultimately consistent nihilists. There never has been and there never will be. Now, we should also point out the very close connection between nihilism and fatalism. And again, these are two attitudes and they're, they're, they're philosophies in their own right, but ultimately they've been sort of distilled down to pragmatic attitudes that people take in the culture, not so much sophisticated philosophical concepts that people adopt, and certainly not a consistent worldview that people are willing to stand by. These are pragmatic attitudes that have now sort of seeped in and pervaded the entire culture. And you can see it again, you can see it in the entertainment industry, in the movie industry, you can see it in the pop culture, in the music industry, you can see it all over in the fashion industry, where people have sort of embraced this fatalistic, nihilistic, and narcissistic attitude that we live in a world of absolute random meaninglessness. And if we live in a world of random meaning and random chance and endless facts and, and, and meaningless succession of endless facts and events, then there is no teleology to life. There is no goal. There is no purpose. There is no reason why you are here. And therefore, life is a life that is lived, as Ecclesiastes would say, under the sun. Everything is futile, vanity of vanities. Everything is grasping for the wind. We'll come back to Ecclesiastes in a moment because I think Ecclesiastes is one of those books that has been in the church neglected to some degree, but that has incredible relevance and is incredibly potent when confronting people with their nihilistic tendencies today. Well, recently I observed two things that really illustrate the nihilistic nature of our culture today. One having to do with assisted suicide as someone in Switzerland has created and legislated a suicide pod where people can conveniently crawl into a chamber, press a button, and kill themselves if they so wish. And the promise of the suicide pod is that this can be done humanely, it can be done painlessly, and it can be done in a way that people die with dignity. Now think about that. We've become that kind of culture, that we are facilitating suicide. We're making suicide high tech. We're making suicide a facility. We're making suicide an industry. We are profiting from people willing to commit self-murder in the name of convenience. And remarkably, this is so twisted that this is done in the name of compassion and in the name of humanity itself. And remarkably, as you find yourself speaking against industrialized suicide, you will be called inhumane, you will be called unloving, you will be called uncaring. This is just another example of what it means to live in a post-Christian world, in a post-everything culture, where the very fabric, the very fundamentals, the very parameters of worldview issues like meaning, morals, and beauty are collapsing in upon the culture. The next is a company that claims to want to take you and instead of cremating you when you die, they turn your body, your corpse, into compost. Then when we ask the question, what kind of world is actually facilitating taking human beings, facilitating their suicide, facilitating their decomposition so that we turn them back into compost that we can sell at Home Depot? 
Well, we're turning into a world that has embraced an utter nihilistic, fundamentally nihilistic, narcissistic, and fatalistic worldview. This is a post-Christian, post-everything culture. You're not human anymore at the end of this process. At the end of the process, you cease to be human. The climate crisis at some fundamental level is a soil crisis. Fully embracing myself is organic matter, just something to rot and decay. wondering how I got here. Farmers had been composting livestock for decades. That's right, composting. Like that sweet soil generating pile in your backyard, but breaking down a dead human body. A revolution was born. By 2015, the first donor bodies were being composted in prototype studies at the Department of Forensic Anthropology at Western Carolina University. Later, here we are, visiting the facility just south of Seattle, Washington. Katrina, kitty cat. <laughs> you did it! <laughs> Ta-da! You've always seen Recompose as a combination of ritual and science and technology. Now, one part of that video is that the introduction said that when you undergo the process of composition or decomposition or, or, or when you die and you go and you're becoming compost, you actually cease to be human. That shows you that there are radical worldview implications behind what this young lady has done in legislating turning human bodies into reusable compost. That is something, a development in the culture that should alarm all of us. But as we think about what scripture has to say about nihilism, uh, it is a lot. Nihilism is ultimately rooted in total depravity. It is rooted in the depravity of man, where man has no problem going headlong into their own self-destruction. In Romans chapter 3, we are told that there is no fear of God in people's eyes, that people will run headlong into destruction. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, we're told the culture will actually be shocked. They will be amazed, surprised that you will not run with them in total excess. And so, therefore, we're looking at a worldview that is not only bent on self-destruction, but they are also so radically committed to their self-destructive ways in rebelling against God, in pursuing autonomy, and in feeding the lust of their own desires such that they have thrown caution to the wind, that they believe that they can sin with impunity. They have no fear of God in their eyes. And if you don't join them in the pursuit of that godless worldview, that the culture will be utterly shocked and amazed that you won't participate in their nihilistic ways. When we think about the woman at the well, it's a perfect example of how we can minister to people the gospel in a nihilistic world. The woman at the well was known mainly because of her multiple adulterous relationships. She had had five husbands and the man that she was with now was not even her husband and we understand that. But at the very fundamental root of this woman was a desire to live contrary to reality, a desire to live a self-destructive life at any means. Perhaps she had a good reason. Perhaps they were practical reasons for her to live a lie. And the woman at the well was ultimately engaged in self-loathing. She hated who she really was. And the minute that Jesus touched on her real self, she began to defend herself. She began to claim to be religious. She began to try to uh, challenge Jesus and his understanding of the history of Jacob's well. But all of those things were for nothing because Jesus wanted to get to the very heart of this woman to show her that her self-destructive ways in pursuit of her lifestyle, her immorality, and whatever codependency she had developed with these lovers that she was associated with, Jesus wanted to show her that in fact, she was pursuing a life of emptiness, a life of futility, 
and that what he had for her was far greater than anything she could provide herself. But we also need to point out that it's not as if in Christianity we do not seek what is best for us. We certainly do. And it's not as if in Christianity we aren't looking for pleasure. We certainly do derive pleasure and joy from the experiences that we have as Christians. And it's also not like in Christianity there is not a category for hatred and for destruction and bringing things to an end. There certainly is. But there again, it is only within the Christian worldview that such powerful fundamental realities are capable of being interpreted in a sound and healthy way, in a philosophically consistent way, and in a way that retains the whole meaning and purpose of life, where meaning, morals, and beauty are preserved. That only happens in a consistent worldview, and that's why biblical Christianity is so important, because it takes all of these issues, man's desire for pleasure, man's desire for self-preservation, man's desire for life, and man's tendency to hate what is futile. That's really ultimately what nihilism is. It is a hatred for futility. But because it has no answers, it ends up becoming the very thing that it hates. It, it hates the supposed contradiction to Christianity, as Nietzsche did, but it ends up adopting impossible contradictions of its own, therefore rendering itself utterly futile in the final analysis. Therefore, we can say that there is a sense in which nihilism does not go far enough. In an exercise of Christian apologetics, we are therefore to push the antithesis, to show the nihilist how weak his nihilism really is. Ecclesiastes is a fascinating book and I think, again, it will become more and more relevant as we approach our cultural milieu today, as it taps into the very vein of thought that we see in this nihilistic and fatalistic society that we live in, where nothing really matters in the grand scheme of things, while Ecclesiastes reminds us that everything ultimately matters, even in a world of futility, but that without a love for the law of God, we will never understand how to interpret the futility that we see all around us. For this, man must have a fundamental heart change. Well, today's nihilism is exquisitely deceptive. It shrouds itself in narcissism and hedonism. And remarkably, people are destroyed by the things that they love, by the things that they pursue. Now, as the original nihilists would have taught, that there is no ultimate meaning, there is no ultimate purpose, there is no ultimate reason, no morals, meaning, or beauty, and that ultimately we hate for the sake of hating, we destroy for the sake of destruction, and we believe in nothing fundamental or essential, but that has no ultimate purpose. Nihilism, in a sense, is an end to itself. It simply seeks the destruction and the deconstruction of everything around it, but for no good reason. There is no philosophical uh, supremacy, there is no priority to be given to any resulting worldview, and therefore for nihilism, the ultimate goal is truly a narcissistic, nihilistic, self-refuting and self-defeating philosophy that lays waste to everything in its path. But in that nihilism, there is no salvation. But the gospel teaches that when we hate things for their proper reasons, we hate sin, we hate things that stand in the way of God. And as we mortify our sin and look at this world for what it really is, that it's fallen, it's condemned under Adam, it's subject to the fall, to sin, to the effects of the fall, the noetic effects of sin in the mind, and also the cosmic effects of sin all over the order of creation. And as we hate our life in this fallen evil age, we learn to love our life in the age to come. This is something that is unique to the biblical worldview, and in this way, 
Everything is redeemed. It's not simply hated. It's not simply opposed for the sake of opposition. But everything that we seek to discard as Christians, everything that Jesus told us, in fact, to even hate, we do it for a higher purpose. We do it for the greatest purpose of all, and that is to know God and to glorify God and to enjoy God forever. That is something nihilism is absolutely incapable of doing.